All right, so um, welcome. Today we'll have a guest lecture from IMC, who is who has been and is uh, one of the, the top sponsors for CS196. Uh, and so we have George and Veronica, is that right? Uh, they'll be talking a little bit about you know, their, their roles at IMC and kind of what work at IMC is like. Uh, so, yeah, awesome.
background on who we are before we start the presentation. Uh, I graduated from U of I with a degree in CS in 2016. Yes, yeah, so I've been 17, one of these years. Um, and I've been working at IMC since I graduated. I previously was an intern at IMC as a software developer, and since graduating, I've been working on the pricing. Uh, hey guys, I'm George. I graduated from this school two years ago, majored in math and computer science. I've been working at IMC ever since. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. I know there is an interesting Cubs game going on now. Um... 
Not the World Series yet. Um, this is a little bit of what we'll go over today, a little background on who is IMC, how we make money, and then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into our tech staff, and then a brief overview of our development process, and if there's time, a little Q&A. So, starting with background, IMC was founded in 1989 in Amsterdam, so we are a Dutch trading company. We also have our office in the Sears slash Willis Tower in Chicago, and another one in Sydney. Since the 30 years, almost, that IMC was started, we've grown into a global firm with over 500 employees. Um, so IMC was started by two traders that were market makers. So even today, IMC is primarily a market making firm. And what I've got pulled up here is the definition of a market maker from Wikipedia. So you guys can read that, but what does that really even mean? Um, one of our favorite examples of what market making is, is, well, you guys probably know when you go to the airport, there's a place that you can exchange your money. So imagine you just got off a flight to Europe and you need some euros. You could just ask some locals to sell you some of their euros, but it's pretty hard to find someone who has enough cash for you and is traveling to the U.S. soon, so they want U.S. dollars. But luckily, instead, in pretty much every airport, there's somewhere that you can exchange the money with someone who has stacks of every currency, including euros, and is willing to trade you any currency for another. They make money by buying any given currency at a slightly lower price than they will sell it to you, which is why there are two prices for each currency listed at an exchange. What IMC does is pretty much the same thing, but with various financial instruments and on exchanges rather than with currencies in a stand at an airport. All right, and electronic trading. IMC actually started out 30 years ago with two people in Amsterdam market making the old-fashioned way. In the years since then, the stock markets have changed dramatically with electronic trading exploding in volume. Market making firms like ours have had to adapt by moving to automated trading systems becoming more technology and developer driven. As everybody moves to a more electronic model for trading, the performance of our systems has become more and more important. Before going into detail about performance, it's useful to define performance what exactly does it mean to be fast? There are two important ways to measure performance, latency and throughput. Latency is the time between a trigger and its response. For example, imagine you want to calculate a multiple of two three-digit numbers. You could ask a fifth grader to do it, and he'd be able to do it in a few minutes. This would be a relatively high latency way to get your answer. You could also ask someone with a calculator to do it, it might take them a few seconds. This is a little bit better. Or finally, you could write a computer program to accomplish this task. On a modern computer, this probably takes a few nanoseconds. That's super low latency, over 100 billion times faster than the fifth grader. The other measure of performance is throughput. Throughput is the maximum rate at which something can be processed. For example, if you need to send some data to New York, you might send it over the internet. However, depending on your connection and how much you have to send, that can take a long time. It could even be faster to actually just drive the data on a hard drive over to New York. Um, this method could have extremely high throughput, but very low latency as it takes a long time. All right, so now that we've gotten into a little bit of the background of IMC and high-frequency trading, we're going to talk a little bit more about the uh, tech architecture at IMC. So this is a pretty broad overview, but we're going to dive into some of them in more detail. Um, we'll go through a couple of the components that are the most important and pretty much align with the development team that we have at IMC. So first off is valuation. And the valuation component is the brains of the operation. It contains our fancy pricing models and tells us how much any given financial instrument is worth. So how exactly do we decide what is the fair price for any given product? Well, the simplest way is to let the other millions of participants in the stock market tell you. We can look at the trading history of any given product, say a stock in Apple, along with the feed of 
buy and sell orders that is constantly updating and try to determine trends. Another way is to find one or more other products that you know are correlated to the one you are interested in and model the relationship between them. So for example, the crude oil markets, there are multiple benchmarks that people use to determine the price of a barrel of oil at any given time. A popular one used is, in Europe is Brent crude, and it's a mix of crude oil from 15 different oil fields in the North Sea. But in the US, we actually use West Texas Intermediate Crude, and it's defined, it's defined in the Midwest and the Gulf Coast and settled in this really remote town in Oklahoma. So this is a graph showing how Brent and WTI, the West Texas, are strongly correlated. So you can usually use changes in one to price the other. Unfortunately, you have to be careful because sometimes that correlation breaks down. For example, in early two. 2011, the storage capacity in Cushing was maxed out because it's such a small town that the price of WTI fell drastically, and you can see at the end of the graph how that relationship broke down. Another way that we can do valuation is to take advantage of the relationships between derivatives. A derivative is a financial instrument whose value is derived from one or more other products and they can be super simple to super complicated. One example is a basket or an index. So if you've heard of the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, those are indices that are used to track the general health of the US stock market. And it represents the average value of, for the S&P 500, the 500 companies, some of which you can see up there that make it up. Another example of a derivative is a forward contract. We're not gonna ask you to like memorize or solve any of these equations, but this is what we're using when we're pricing these forward contracts, which is just, in this case, an agreement to buy something in the future instead of now. And even more complicated is a derivative, is an option contract, which is like the forward, where you're buying it or selling it in the future, but it also has optionality to it. So option pricing is therefore more complicated, and this equation you see up here is called the Black-Scholes Differential Equation, which won a Nobel Prize and is what most option pricing at trading companies is based on. So there are three main techniques for doing valuation, the market feed, the correlated products, and the derivatives. Um, we can furthermore combine all those to get better and more sophisticated valuation. For example, you can look at the market feed for all the correlated crude oil benchmarks and their thousands of derivatives and use all of that to inform you of what the pricing should be for all of them. Uh, there's definitely some challenges when it comes to valuation. So developers that work on the valuation stack face an interesting set of them, including um, there's hundreds of thousands of products that we want to be able to price in a reasonable amount of time. So we often use parallel algorithms and concurrency and programming for this uh, high throughput. We also need to understand the good software library design because the pricing libraries are used by many different components and you also have to have a background in math and quantitative uh, research. Okay, so that's the valuation portion of our system, which is, our, as Veronica mentioned, the smartest portion of our system, which also makes it the slowest. So our valuation components operate often on the seconds or even minutes time range, and these valuations get passed to our execution part of the system, which actually does our trading, which likes to operate more in the millisecond or nanosecond range. So first of all, the pricing comes in from our valuation stack and hits our execution software. The execution component is in charge of actually knowing what trades we want to do on a market and what orders we want to have sitting on the market. We need to not only know that what something is worth, but that we're going to be able to trade with someone profitably uh, based around that valuation. There are two main ways of making that happen. We can make liquidity. Making liquidity means adding liquidity to the market and standing open ready to make a trade. So going back to the airport example, the, uh, the worker at the currency exchange stands ready to buy and sell different currencies at different price for a small profit. 
He's making liquidity by being available to trade at those prices. We can do similarly by placing orders on exchanges and being ready to trade around our valuation. Our second option is to take liquidity. It's the exact opposite. Our execution component will also scan the markets and see what orders are resting through from other market participants and decide which ones uh, offer enough instant profit for us to actually make that trade. This is the portion of our system that requires the uh, lowest latency, as it's pretty likely that if we see something and view it as a good deal, somebody else probably does too. So that's when we are really concerned with executing these trades as quickly as possible. The, that constitutes half of something we call the critical loop, which is the area of our software that we need to go the absolute fastest. The other portion of this is drivers. Drivers are what actually communicate with the exchanges. There are 15 options exchanges across America and they all speak a different language. So we need to have a way to convert each exchange's view of orders and trades into an IMC specific way so that we can combine them all together and react to them. These drivers actually touch the exchanges and that's how we place the orders as well as react to uh, updates from the exchanges. The challenges on the execution side of things are a little bit different. What we really need here is low latency and fast response times if you need to update an order or if we want to see, if we see a trade we want to do. The challenges we face are primarily driven by this requirement. We need to understand stuff like how the code actually compiles into machine language, how memory caches work, and other down to the metal details. This low latency requirement also drives us to switch to different programming languages, sometimes in different architectures. So we'll often need to be proficient in many different technologies. So the execution engine and the drivers talk to the exchanges to send orders and make those trades. The trades that we make are then sent back into this system to inform our decisions about future trades. And one of the most important things, especially from a safety point of view, is reconciliation. So what reconcil reconciliation is, is when we double check that the trades that we think that we did match up with the trades that the exchanges or our clearing firm, aka our bank, Think that we made. This way, if we have a bug in our system that's sending unintended trades or trades at the wrong prices for the wrong amount, anything like that, we notice quickly and we can deal with it before it becomes a huge deal. And the final portion of our system is analysis. This actually isn't a live component of our trading, but it's extremely important. Things are changing all the time in trading. A strategy that we set up yesterday and was working might not be working as well today. So we need to build extremely sophisticated tooling to monitor what we're doing. Is it working? What can we be doing better? And how do we do it? The developers working on our analysis tooling have an even different set of challenges. They don't have as many performance requirements since their output is consumed by people rather than other machines. But they do have to deal with enormous amounts of data. Market feed for hundreds of thousands of products, um, and processing all the orders that we send. They need to uh, tie all this data together into a form that people can consume and analyze. We tend to leverage big data technologies like Hadoop and Spark and other uh, cluster computing tools. Finally, we need to divide, design user interfaces for querying and manipulating all this data. The actual last component that we're going to talk about is our risk management. So risk management is where we make sure we understand and have accounted for all the risks in the trades that we've done and the trades that we want to do in the future. So when you guys hear about the stories in the news of high frequency trading companies that lose millions of dollars in a matter of seconds, we don't want to become one of those stories in the news. So the primary goal is to make sure that we're not overly exposed to any one risk because we can never be 100% confident in our pricing, um, especially because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. For example, we might have a bunch of British pounds that we've bought on the market and then Britain announced that they have Brexit and we're going to be losing a lot of money no matter how much we initially thought that the, those pounds were worth. So one way that we calculate risk is to use pricing models and equations to determine our exposure to all the things that might affect price. Some of these things like interest rates, um, which are set by the Fed, the dividends that you might get paid out for owning a stock, time, everything like that. And we do this by taking partial derivatives of the price with respect to each of these inputs. 
Um, we call these Greeks in the industry. I've shared a few of them here, but basically these are all just examples of the risks that we have to take into account when we're pricing these different things that we're trading on the exchanges. Cool. So really fast, just a little bit about how IMC works. We develop all of the trading components in-house. Very little, if anything, is done third-party. We'll definitely leverage open source libraries and frameworks to help build the software we need, but most of everything we do is built by IMC developers. We use an agile development process, releasing software incrementally, working closely with our clients, who are really just the traders at IMC. We have a continuous integration cycle, meaning that we upgrade our production systems every night and are always using a newer version of our own software. The vast majority of what we do is written in Java. Why Java? Well, there are advantages and disadvantages. The pros of Java is that there's a ton of good tooling, even within the Java standard libraries, and then also there are many different frameworks built to integrate well with Java. It's also relatively easy to develop and iterate, so we're able to get ideas into production quickly, and the performance of it is pretty good. Some of the cons of Java are the real-time garbage collection, which can be a pain when we're uh, trying to build low-latency software, as well as a lack of low-level controls since the JVM takes over. Some challenges in our industry. Um, as we're getting faster, everybody's getting faster. So there's a constant demand for us to both make our systems faster and scale them up. Additionally, since trading is getting more sophisticated and algorithmic in general, there's less money to be made on each individual trade since everybody's using a similar system. And finally, there are some growing pains as we transfer in just a 30-year period from a few people trading in the pit to a, basically a full technology company. That's the end of what we've got for you guys. Um, let us know if you have any questions. How much of this like presentation did I know going in? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> I studied math and computer science here, and then I did an internship at Zillow, which didn't have anything to do with the financial markets, and I came in completely, completely knowledgeless and learned everything on the job. And I can echo that. Going into a trading company, I had zero finance background, and funny enough, a lot of our traders that come in actually don't have any trading experience either. It's not really something you get at college unless they've added option theory classes in the last year since I've been here. Really all of it is super industry specific, so it's something like we have interns and full-times that are have very little experience or no experience in anything finance related, and we teach it all to you on the job. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. We do offer internships. They're mostly for upperclassmen, so it's something to keep in mind more going forward through your years. But I think just staying involved with the cool projects here, getting interested in the industry, reading about finance, if that's something that interests you, I think those are all good ways to stay in the loop and keep, keep up to date on it. But we're really just looking for people that have tackled tough problems. So I would say focus on whatever it is that you're interested in here, and, um, and we look forward to seeing your internship application. Okay, cool. Thanks so much everybody for coming. Veronica's writing a link down here that I wonder if we can all see behind the projector screen. But if you guys are interested in staying in touch with IMC and getting updates about uh, opportunities and what we have going on, please follow this link and then check in for the IMC trading at CS196 event. It's piazza.com slash events. Thanks so much everybody.
the end if anybody has uh, individual questions. Thanks, everybody. Okay, uh, so we'll go through uh, a little bit of uh, Python stuff too. Uh, but before that, just a few announcements. Uh, so uh, homework four will be out on Thursday, and we'll give you uh, a whole week and a half to work on it instead of just a week. Um, so it'll be due uh, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after. Uh, and so this way you'll, you'll get you know, four sets of office hours if you want help on it, or uh, you know longer to progress. So, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, and then other like timeline things, uh, per project we'll have like a midpoint check-in presentation where you'll come up and kind of, uh, you don't have to present, but you just talk about, uh, you know, how your project is going, uh, you know, uh, like if you have something to demo, demo, you can always do that, but it'll just be more of a informal uh, uh, session where you check in. Um, and then, so that, that'll happen November 6th. Uh, and then the week after, which is the week before Thanksgiving, uh, is when you'll si sign up and take the uh, CBTF midterm. Uh, I think you guys have already done that for 125, uh, so you, can, you're, you know how that works. Uh, we'll let you know when sign up's open, uh, so, you know, uh, take it when you want. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll release more uh, details about the Allegro once you guys have them out. Thanks. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll let you, we'll, we'll give you guys more details about uh, the midterm uh, when we have them. Awesome. So, let's do something like that. Alright, uh, let's first start with, how was homework three? Who felt like they wanted to drop the class after the yeah. same? I, I felt that way too when I when I took this class. Homework three was uh, probably what my instructor at the time. He we used to have a Facebook group, uh, and, and in the Facebook group he put in "rib freshman" and, and he pasted a link to the, the, the homework. So it was hard, and you know uh, I felt that way. Everyone else feels that way, but I think uh, it's not the good part is it's not going to get you know it's not going to get any worse. So you know homework will will be easier or at the same level of difficulty. Um, but you know, we're also giving you more office hours, or more, uh, and then you guys will get better at it, for sure. So uh, you know, stick with it. Uh, and awesome. So today we'll uh, we'll we'll do dictionaries, which will be um, so you'll see dictionaries on your next homework, uh, and we might even do. Uh, I think yeah. So there is there is a problem in here which you might see a uh, variant of in your homework. So uh, I'll move on. all right, cool. So let's start with. Uh, Start with what a dictionary is. Um, okay, I think I'll have someone from the audience tell me. What is a dictionary? Yell it out. The book with words. Louder. It's okay. It's also a hash map, sure. What else? What is a hash map? It's an array of keys and values that takes and converts keys by half of Wait, wait, wait. Someone else. <laughs> you know, not not Jason too. I want I want someone from that part of the room. You know who you are. Yell it out if you if you have an idea. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I don't even hear anything, so that's fine. So yeah, dictionaries are uh, they are hash maps. They're also known as hash maps. Uh, and then basically they, you know, the, the crucial part about dictionaries is that they let you store uh, what are called key value pairs. And so effectively, you know, you can have, uh, you can have mappings of uh, keys to values. And so you'll see, you'll see why that's useful and you'll see what you can do um, with that as a concept uh, in, in, in Python and other languages. 
So, uh, a couple of important things. Uh, they are not ordered, so you can store, um, you know, you, you, so you can access like elements by their index, uh, but if you want to like, like find a specific value, you can just kind of reference the value using the key. So you can get, you can, you know, write code to get the, val get the value of a certain key. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at some examples uh, here. So can you all read this? Big enough, right? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so what is what is Lantern going to do? No, not the not the line I just ran, but the line I'm going to run next. So this one. Okay, so what are the keys in this dictionary? Great, awesome. So. Uh, hello is the key, world is the value, one is another key, there is another value. So simple enough. Um, and then you can also, so this is what I meant by, you can access the value by uh, indexing with the key. So you can say, you want to assign uh, the, like this key, this key, so you can just uh, that, and then at the, at the key key, there is um, there's the, the value value. So, so that's uh, kind of the basic concept you can have. Uh, Keys and values, um, and so you can also. Okay, great. Um, so, all right. What is this going to give me? Like, what is this line doing? Great. So you're checking if the, the string hello is inside your dictionary, uh, and so, so the best part about about Python is that the syntax is like basically English. You're just you, you want something, and so you're you're asking it. Is it in the dictionary? And it says true. It is. So you want to, you know, uh, we're not talking about uh, complicated syntax. All right. So another way to, to access uh, the keys in the dictionary is just uh, to, to like, pretty much say dot keys on the dictionary. So so we'll also give you uh, true because it's the same thing. Um, and then this will give you false because world is a value, not it. So if I if I change this. Again, give me true because because um, true is value. So uh, that's how that works. Uh, same thing here. It's just going to print. Uh, just going to print uh, that the, the, the key. Is the awesome. Uh, you can also run like the list like commands on it. So you can say like what is the length of uh, my div. So who wants to tell me what the length is? Is it going to be two or four? Two. Who says four? No, 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 <laughs> Two or four? <laughs> All of God played. All right. Why is it three? Because I added key and value. Great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, yeah. So, the point is, yeah, you can still do all of your standard uh, list like commands on. On dictionaries, um, this is how you would loop through it. So, it's, it's, there's two ways to do it. You can also, uh, so you can pretty much say for key in the dictionary and then uh, print, basically just print uh, key of the value. Uh, so, these are the three values in there. Um, the other way to do it is to use this dot items function. And so, that will basically uh, collect all the items and then you can iterate uh, through uh, all of those. So, is it going to so we that great. So we had a number in there. So, so you want to like make sure you have the right types. Say this every class. Um, but so yeah, so that's uh, how you would uh, I guess uh, iterate through your dictionary and like uh, delete things, add things. Right, so let's let's do a delete. So we we got rid of. Um, both the one and the hello, and so uh, it also deletes the values that are associated with those keys. Um, so you've got to remember that they're you know, like the key value is one pair, and so it's one individual thing. And so if you're doing the key, you're also doing the value. Um, so awesome. Um, all right. So now is the actual yeah, fun part. So why, like, why do we care about dictionaries, and why do we care about this? 
you hear me? Okay. Why do we care about this like key value pair thing? So uh, I guess the most important thing that, uh, that you want to remember is that dictionaries are really efficient. Uh, we haven't gotten to big O yet, so you don't, I guess all of you don't understand what like, efficiency is and runtime is. I know Allegra talked about it a little bit, but uh, we'll have Allegra on it, I think, in for the next couple of weeks. So uh, for now, what you should know is that is that dictionaries are uh, very efficient. And so, uh, you know, like, like there's an example here. I think um, they have whatever, uh, a, million, a million items, and you want to like, search through it. Um, a hash map for... So in a hash map or a dictionary, just looking up uh, a key value pair is, is basically uh, in, in constant time, but it's basically uh, the fastest operation that you can do. Um, and yeah, once you get to CS, CS 225, you'll actually be um, building a hash map of your own. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. So um, cool, let's work through uh, this example. So there's, there's two more examples that we'll go through, which will be uh, pretty useful for homework. So, Let's have, all right, let's, have uh, let's have you guys like work through it first on your own, uh, and then uh, I want to see I want to see if you guys know what this is doing. Yeah. Okay. And then what should the app be? Yeah, like what is this thing? What is this? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Sure? Okay, let's run it. I tricked you. Alright, so this this does break one, two, three, four, five. Who wants to walk through it and tell us why? Do you want to do it now? Like, you want to, you want to tell the class? Here. Explain. Okay. Oh, cool. This works. So, like, list two is associated with both of the um, keys of the dictionary. Um, the dictionary keys are one and two, and they're associated, they're both associated with list two. So, when we go to the second to last line, um, Dict one, okay, so that key one um, is associated with list two, so we're appending five to list two. And then when we call the second um, key of the dictionary, then we're, we're just calling that list two again, because one and two are both associated with list two. That was a short question. Sorry, say that again. What is the question? So you, you wanna you wanna assign one list to another one? And then then do what? Okay, let's try it. So you wanna do something like equal list two and then do what? So you, are you asking if list one will also change? No. So if you make it, if you change list two after you assign them to be equal, list one will contain what list two did before you append it. Make sense? Okay. If you have more questions, we can talk after class. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, so let's let's move on to this. Um, let's move on to this example. Uh, this is uh, I think. This is a pretty uh, exciting one, I guess, because this is like, similar to what will uh, show up on, on your homework. Um, so let's uh, yeah, let's, let's take a second and like work through it, or I guess I can work through it with you guys. Um, so the point of the problem is to uh, just re return a dictionary that maps a character to, to how many times it occurs. So you're counting uh, the number of times that one specific uh, character like is And so uh, for an input string. A, A, B, C, C, hello, it should get back um, the thing that looks like this, which is like, oh boy. Which is that, like, okay, A shows up two times, B once, 
uh, and so you get the idea. So, um, all right, let's first start with, can you do this without a dictionary? Yes. Okay. Why would you do this with a dictionary? Instead of a, like, non-dictionary approach. Well, that also, but the main advantage is that dictionaries are faster. And so, you know, the same thing they, that you would do without a dictionary, with the dictionary, will be, uh, sort of, it'll, it'll run faster. Apply, like, a million, uh, you know, arguments to this program, then, you know, we'll see uh, a runtime bit. And we'll get more, we'll get, we'll talk more about uh, runtime. Uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. But, all right, so let's work through the program. So you have, uh, you set up a dictionary called character counts, um, and then you loop through uh, each character in the string. Uh, so you would go A, A, B, like one at a time, uh, and then you're checking if uh, this character is already in the dictionary. Uh, so if, it, if it's not, uh, then you make the count of it one, right, because you haven't seen it before. Uh, and if you have seen it before, you just increment the count of that character um, by one. So you're basically, you know, if you've seen it before, you add it uh, like a plus one, otherwise you just make it one, um, and then return character. So let's run this, and it gives us two one, two one, one, two one. Yeah, so the outputs match, um, and, you know, so, who doesn't understand what this line does? So that's the only important line in this program. You're accessing the key of that character that you are looping through, and then you know assigning a value of one or plus equal to one, depending on uh, whether you've seen it or not. So, that's basically how you would access uh, like you know keys in the dictionary. Make sense? Okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I think. Is basically it. Is there other questions about dictionaries or um, anything else that we talked about today? Okay, great. So homework four will be out Thursday, not today. Uh, and you'll have uh, Friday, Monday, and then another set of Friday and Monday office hours to, uh, to work on it. So, uh, you know. Oh, and Andrew wanted me to let you guys know that let's uh, stick to Piazza for homework questions and not Slack. I think he like gets woken up at night or something, so uh, he doesn't know how to how to use notifications. So um, awesome, cool. Uh, I think Allegra has yes uh, attendance. So to get credit for coming to class today, uh, there is a form in the Slack, and the keyword for today is IMC. So fill out the form. I know some of you probably guessed it and filled out the form, but yeah, we're predictable. So uh, awesome. So. Uh, the link is in the Slack. Uh, if you're not in the Slack, week six is a great time to join the Slack, so let's do it. Um, but awesome. I think I think George and Veronica are still here, so uh, feel free to talk to them if you have questions about IMC. Cool.